Welcome to everyone who's joined us. I'm the Easy Coach, Ethan Evans, and I'm here today to talk about working with executives, which I know a lot about, as opposed to getting our broadcast live on time, which I'm still learning about. Um, in the meantime, a uh, couple quick instructions. First, uh, it really helps us if you vote on questions. So let me explain how our broadcast works a little bit. Here at the Easy Coach, my goal is to help you be successful in your career by sharing my experience and advice based on all I've done over the last 25 years, the last 14 at Amazon. And uh, to help me with that, there is a widget you should see on your screen that says the Easy Coach QA, ask the Easy Coach a question. And this is only for people on the web. I'll explain mobile in just a second. But if you're on the web, um, what I need you to do, uh, or what you can do, is open up that widget and go to the questions, and you'll see some questions already entered by other viewers. And you can upvote those questions by clicking on the little arrow if one of those questions is something you'd like me to answer first or to make sure I get to. If you want to ask your own questions, you will have to log in and you will have to authorize the widget, click share your user ID with it. But once you do that, you can ask questions. Now, we know a lot of our audience is on mobile and this doesn't work as well there. So what you can do there is if you have a question and you're on iOS or Android, um, you can just put a question in chat and our helpful moderator, Pink Dragons, will go ahead and stick it in as a question in the Q&A and other people can vote on it. So today we're going to talk about working with executives. And I've been lucky enough in my career to work directly with some of the most famous and challenging executives in the space. Some are famous, some are challenging, not always the same. Uh, so I work at Amazon, uh, means I have had the chance sometimes to work with uh, now the wealthiest man on earth, Jeff Bezos, as well as um, the CEO of AWS, Andy Jassy, the CEO of Twitch, where I work within Amazon, Emmett Shear. But in the past, I've also worked with startup CEOs and with Bob Davis from Lycos, the long ago search engine, who wrote uh, a book called Speed is Life. So we can talk a little bit about that. But based on all those experiences, before we go into Q&A, um, I want to uh, just share uh, a couple things I've learned about kind of all executives. And what I found is in talking to people internal uh, to my job, that unfortunately, though we don't intend to be most of the time anyway, executives like myself and some of those uh, CEO level executives are quite scary. And when you get down to the basic problem, people are afraid of them. And that makes the interactions bad for you or hard or worrisome, high stakes, stressful, and can ruin a whole interaction that doesn't need to be that way. Um, and so I want to explain quickly some of the scary behaviors you'll see from CEOs. Um, <clears throat> so I haven't seen anybody vote on any questions yet or any new ones get entered. Um, and so uh, if you do have anything you want to ask, go ahead and make sure you go through that process. Uh, otherwise, I'll be hitting up the first couple questions we already have in just a minute. Um, so what makes executives seem scary? Having studied this and listened to people, there's a few things. But generally, I find that most of the executives I've worked with are very direct and very intense. So the first thing that can make us scary is if you um, run into that, uh, Dave, are we sure chat's working? Because it's dead, like nothing. I would normally expect people to have commented. And if you're out there and can add anything to chat, I'm not seeing it here right now. Oh, there we go. Shadow Fox says we're here. Fantastic. So thank you, Shadow Fox, one of our excellent moderators, 
who couldn't uh, we couldn't put this show on without her help, by the way. So um, listening to the story. Well, good. Uh, <clears throat> so what makes executives scary is they're intense and very direct. And I think that partly comes from the sort of personality that generally pursues executive management. And then it partly comes from the environment. Let me explain that. An executive, say running Amazon, has a case of extreme time famine. Uh, Amazon now is something like half a million people globally. And so one of the big executives at our company may meet with an individual team only once a year for an hour or two. And it also means they're meeting with dozens or hundreds of teams over the course of the year. What that means is A, they don't recall everything they might have heard about your project six months ago or a year ago. And B, they feel a great urgency to get all of their ideas across in the 45 minutes or hour or hour and a half they have with you. So if you think about it from the executive perspective, they have one meeting with you, maybe a month, maybe a quarter, maybe a year, to tell you everything they have in their head and to make sure that you're on the right track in their minds. So if that's true, it can make us very blunt because we don't want anyone uh, um, we don't want anyone uh, to mistake what we're saying. And so in that sense, we can be hammers. And so if you see that, if you start getting really direct feedback from an executive, they're probably worried that you're about to go off in a direction they don't support or that they don't understand and that they're not going to see it for three months later until three months later, and you're gonna be very off track at that point, or all that work's gonna be wasted. Now, that isn't always true. Executives get upset like regular people. They can be very blunt for other reasons, but just consider if you have in the mindset, this person I'm about to go see, this person I'm having a meeting with, hasn't thought about my project since the last time I met with them, and has to give me all their input in this meeting, it will help you better understand some of their interactions. The second thing I would say is executives really want to have good results. And that's either because like, if it's a startup founder, they own part of the company and it's their baby, or if they're in a leadership position, they're measured on how they perform and they think that way and they have a board to answer to. So they're actually not trying to micromanage you. But this will be a surprise. If you're afraid of executives, they're basically in the meeting afraid of failure. Can't say it's universal, but most executives I know and have worked with, they're always afraid that something somewhere in their organization is going to go badly wrong that they could have fixed if only they'd have known about it. And so the thing executives dislike the most is being surprised by bad news. And so they're in the meeting trying to figure out, is this team on track and going to give me good news? Or are they off track and I'm going to get surprised by bad news? And so with that in mind, understand you may be very tense or worried about how to get your message across, how to get your project approved, they're very worried about, is this team and are you gonna make good decisions? And so they're there in that limited time trying to figure out, are you on top of the situation? So what do you do? Well, the great thing about this is it means you're there to provide comfort. You may not think that's your job, but you're really there to explain things in safe terms. Now, that doesn't mean executives won't take risk, but if they're going to take a risk on product or money, they want to do that with someone they feel is competent. So 
like Pink Dragons just added, they want to see your conviction around what you're pitching. They want to see that you believe and are on top of the details. So a meeting with an executive is a little bit psychotherapy and is a little bit uh, sales. And it's a lot about answering questions confidently. So with that as a summary, and I'm just looking at my notes here, just understand that when executives seem intense and scary, they're really trying to solve for their need to make sure that everything's on track and that you are on top of the details. So with that background, your role is really to earn trust in that capacity. And with that, I'll switch to questions. I will say if others have questions to add, I know some people have joined the stream since I started talking. Um, if you want to ask a question, go to the Easy Coach question and answer widget, which should be on your screen if you're on the web, and click and ask a question. You can upvote a question using the arrows uh, next to the number of points, and adding 50 points to any question is free. Um, second, uh, if you are on mobile, just add your question in chat, and our moderator, Pink Dragons, will go ahead and add it to the question and answer voting. Your voting really helps me because it makes sure I answer your questions in the order that most of the audience would like to hear about them. So with that, I'll take the first one. Um, <clears throat> oh, here we go. Executives can be terrifying to talk with. And of course, you're second guessing every word after the conversation. Comment from Shadow Fox. Absolutely true. Uh, interesting thing, we don't intend to be terrifying. When I gave this talk to an internal audience, um, one time, I was surprised to learn how much fear there was in the room, and so I've had a long time to reflect on that. It's not our goal to terrify you. It's actually our goal to enable you to move faster. What all executives do want is more results and more good business progress. So they're trying to figure out how to get there, and as a personality, most executives are a driver type, and so if they don't know what else to do, they become hammers. But what they're trying to do is enable you to move the business forward. And that's actually a good comment. I was trying to think of the last time I personally refused a request, denied a purchase order, canceled a contract, um, totally denied my team and said, you may not do this thing, you must do this other thing. I certainly given my teams lots of feedback and some of my team members and peers are here watching tonight. So they'll call me on it if they think it's different. Uh, and I welcome that by the way, if you have things to add in chat, whether you agree with me or not, go crazy. I love a good controversial discussion. Um, but look, we're trying to figure out how to get our teams to move faster. We want you to take risks. We want you to be comfortable. We want to be in agreement with you where you're going so that you can do more. That's only good for us, right? Just pure selfishness. If you're accomplishing more, uh, one of my favorite sayings is nothing makes a skipper look as good as a fast boat. The team is the executive's boat. The executive can't do anything by him or herself. We need you, our teams, to get us there. So first question how to best react when an executive doesn't agree with your proposal or idea in a group meeting? That's a great question. The best way to react is first remain calm. Do not get defensive. If you get in a sparring match, simple truth, I don't love it, it is true, many executives need to win. They, they're personality type is one where they always are striving to win. And if you get in a context contest of wills in a meeting room, you can push them into a situation where they feel that to do their job and to maintain respect, they need to win. So don't get into a debate that is win-lose um, and don't become defensive. Ask questions. Try to understand. Why don't they agree in detail? The single best question here was taught to me 
by one of my longtime peers and managers in Amazon Games who said, under what conditions would you? So turn it around and say, you don't seem to agree with this proposal. Can you tell me why? And try to get the specifics, try to understand what the concern is, but then absolutely ask, can you tell me what conditions would make this work for you? We think we should, whatever, build a new space station, that that's a good business. I understand you don't agree. What would have to be true for you to um, support the idea that we should build a space station? What would need to be true? And that question will get them thinking positively because suddenly they can list whatever they need and you can be taking notes and saying, oh, they're worried about this. It would need to be that. Um, the second thing is, if it's really going badly, get out of the room and come back later. Um, <clears throat> so get out of the room, figure out what you need to do, ask in private back channels, but don't have the meeting go really south and entrench. So that would be my advice on how to best react. Um, <clears throat> right, and uh, someone adds here, it makes them a collaborator. And that's Matt 3.0. Uh, that is absolutely correct. Uh, we absolutely turn people into collaborators, get them problem solving with you, not telling you what to do or what not to do. And if you can't do that, get out of the room. All right, the next question is, how does one as a team leader work with other supervisors that may be more old school in that they refuse to share power or information? And I, I know uh, R.G. Redmond here who submitted that. I thank him for that question because it's a sad but true question. I'm used to working with executives uh, that are a pretty high level, leading tens of thousands of people and pretty competent. But you do have people for whom information is used as a way to be in charge, to take control. Um, my first advice here, which is maybe sad, is you may have to leave that situation. In other words, just like there are bad bosses, and we kind of talked about that last week, in our segment on considering becoming a manager, there are poor executives. Um, and so if your supervisor really just wants you to take orders and you want to do something more novel than take orders, you're going to have a problem. But this is really about building trust. In other words, I point out that all executives either are really hardworking or tell themselves that they are. Very few executives sit around and say, this is great, I don't do anything. I get paid really well and I don't work very much. That's not what you believe about yourself, it's not what they believe about themselves. So, if you can build the trust that you're trying to help, most people will share. You can also try to build the trust um, that by sharing with you, you're going to make them look good. In other words, I mentioned earlier how executives start with a lot of fear inside. And you're trying to get them away from that fear. This is a special case of fear. I think when an old school supervisor refuses to share power information, uh, number one, um, <clears throat> Uh, they're trying to, uh, they're trying to um, control maybe, but number two, consider that the executive may not be sharing the information for some other reason, and you can ask that. But in other words, it seems like you know something that uh, you want to, uh, you don't want to share or. But don't ask that in public. Like, take them aside and say, hey, that meeting didn't go that well. You know, what would, it's the same question I just gave you. What would enable you to tell me more? Under what conditions would you be comfortable with me taking on this project? You want to frame things in a way that make people um, a collaborator. <clears throat> um, 
Um, <laughs> so there's a question in chat here that's kind of relevant to this. I'll just go ahead and take it from Washington, Jeremy. Uh, and I love that he said a roller rink uh, skating right now. I will say ice skating is much better than roller skating, but I happen to know that he's from Australia, and so that may not fit him completely. Uh, that said, um, is there ever a case where you want to have an executive be a little bit nervous? Generally, that's going to work out poorly. Um, people, any person being driven by fear um, is probably not thinking clearly, and they're going to tend towards prescribing what you should do and telling more than asking, discussing, or endorsing. That said, um, there are times where a little bit of fear can work. For example, fear of missing out, fear of a competitor. I wouldn't say you ever use scare tactics, but if there are valid risks in a, in a situation, it is okay to explain to an executive, here's the downside of not acting. You want to do that in a way, though, where you sound competent and not threatening, but like where you're trying to save them from a risk. So the fear is still there. Believe me, we executives are very good at fearing because we're fearing our own failure we're fearing being seen as our by our bosses or the public as having failed. We're fearing bad business results. We have lots of fears, just like you do. But we um, that fear is your way. Oh, hey, thank you, Matt. Um, the fear uh, drives you in a bad way unless it's presented nicely. Now, a little bit of proper fear about our competitor is doing this thing or the market is changing, that can drive action and investment and that's legitimate. So I would say that's when you want people to worry. I appreciate everybody is voting now. It's great. We're getting a lot of stuff in. So how important is FaceTime with the executive team and how can someone get more of it? This is a great question um, <clears throat> and I appreciate whoever added it because uh, I see it came through our intermediary pink dragons. Um, so FaceTime with executives. What we don't like is requests of, can we have more FaceTime? There's got to be a purpose. We're very busy. Um, and so the way to get more FaceTime is show value. Um, but if you're not already working on something where you can demonstrate value, the easiest and best question every executive loves is, hey, what are you worried about? Where do you need help that I could give you some help? I have some free time, even if you don't. I have some free time. Uh, where can I help you? How can I, what can I take off your plate? What's worrying you? Executives, as I mentioned, I called it fear, but we have a constant list of worries. We're worried about Project Acme and we're worried about been the person in finance, and we have a whole list. And if you're willing to help, that means I get to take one of my worries and make it one of your worries. Now, the trade-off you get out of this is then we're going to interact about my worry. Um, there's only one time where an executive, just like a manager, I've talked about this before, doesn't love the question, how can I help you? And that's when their answer has to be, well, actually, I need you to do your current job well. Um, you've got to be getting your current job done. How do we get the app to vote on questions? Unfortunately, Matt, the technology doesn't extend that well to the app. Um, and so we are working on that. We have a developer on it right now. It's probably going to take us a couple more shows before we can get good voting off the phone. Um, but if there's a question you really want me to answer, go ahead and uh, tell Pink Dragons here in chat and we'll kind of mentally add it to the tally. And we apologize that the technology doesn't work out in the app just yet. Um, finishing the thought, though, on what I was saying, if you want more FaceTime with executives, you basically have to earn it. Um, you do that by showing value. And the easiest way to do that is offer to help. And so you get more FaceTime and FaceTime is valuable because it's all about building trust. So you do something good or offer to do something and you do it well, and that earns you some trust. 
and then you offer again and you earn more trust and it's a cycle. And pretty soon you'll find the executives coming to you and leaning on you and pulling you into things because helpful, smart people get more work and unhelpful, unsmart people uh, get put in what the Japanese call a window seat. So interesting side note, uh, here in the US, we value sitting at the window. The beautiful view, usually, hopefully. Um, in other cultures, the window seat is away from the core. And the thought is the heart of the company is in the core of the building where the middle and the action is. And the further towards the periphery you are, the less well you're doing. So at least in the 80s, it may be dated now, there was something ascribed to Japanese companies where as opposed to firing someone, they would just put them in a window seat. It meant parking them far away where they can't do any harm and they're not very interesting or involved. Uh, now you don't wanna be parked in a metaphysical window seat, um, but executives absolutely will do this if they're not good at managing performance issues or if they feel they don't have time right now, if uh, they find someone is more trouble than they're worth, they'll just stop interacting with them. Their triage will be up. Oh, I don't have time for that. It's never valuable. Cut all my meetings with that person. Let their manager figure it out or HR will get to it eventually, but I have no time for it. So you want to earn that time and keep doing valuable things. Duh. But you want to avoid being a time suck. And so that also means short, efficient communication. All right. So I went on a little bit at length about that. Um, I do see uh, we're chopping through the questions pretty well. So if other audience members have questions they want to add to the list, either on the web, go ahead, or through chat, and our moderators will put them in. Um, and I can talk more at length about some of it. I can also uh, share some of my examples from some of the better known executives I've worked with that play on these questions. But what I'll do right now is I'll take the next question that's in chat. Um, how do you give execs the appropriate amount of context for a large project when you may only have a short time with them? This is a really difficult uh, challenge and it definitely depends on how that exec absorbs information. So without being political about it or spending too much time about it, you can ask around and figure out do they get it through email? Do they like a short briefing? Do they read a big document in the meeting? Do they look at PowerPoint? Like, how do they absorb information? Do they need to be told by their, their assistant the day before? You get it to them that way and in the right level of detail. Um, and yeah, I see Shadowfox commented on, it's super cool to know about the window seat mindset. Yeah, unfortunately, um, going back to that real quickly, not every manager is good at giving performance feedback. That's not the topic of our show tonight. It's one we can cover another time. But um, the managers who aren't good at performance feedback, whether they do it consciously, which some of them do, or unconsciously, they just basically take an approach that says, well, if I ignore that person, maybe they'll get the hint and go away. And so that's where the window seat comes from, is they just slowly pull all the interesting uh, work away from them and they put them further and further away. And actually, if, you're, if this pop culture reference is one you've seen, this makes perfect sense if you've ever seen the movie Office Space. I don't remember the guy's name, but he's the guy with the red stapler who ends up seated in like the boiler room in the basement. Um, the company's judged him as... That's that company's version of a window seat. They put him in the basement, Milton. Thank you, Donkey Kong. So Milton gets put in the basement in a boiler room and no one will tell him anything, no matter what he complains about. And that's because they've decided he has no value and they're just pushing him as far out of the flow as they can. So um, giving the appropriate amount of context. To give the appropriate amount of context, uh, really comes down to you building your communication skills so that you can summarize something pretty briefly and know what the key points are. Context doesn't have to take a ton of time. The second thing you can do is a trick called having a backup document. 
So you give the context, and then if you start getting deeper questions, you say, hey, you know, we have a demo of this, or we have a short video, or we have a two-page document on this topic. Do you want to stop and read that real quick or see that real quick so that you have more context? It's a lot about good communication skills are about checking for understanding. Have I been clear? Do you have any questions? Do you need more details? Those types of verifiers let the person say, well, I understand this, but not that. Most executives develop a real willingness to admit they don't know um, what they don't know about something and they don't feel bad about it. Uh, we have tons of acronyms at Amazon and I often find myself asking, what does this mean? I've seen, I can't remember what it was now, but earlier this past week, I ran into an acronym that uh, was a common set of three letters. I could think of five meanings for it, none of which made sense in context, so I just needed to ask. And once I asked, they explained to me, and it was something I have never guessed. Again, I can't recall the exact example, but executives get really comfortable just asking, particularly if you invite them. If you give them social permission to say, do you have the context? They will generally tell you. Now, earlier, Redmond... Uh, brought up the question, what about poor executives, old school executives who hoard power? Well, they can't ever admit that they don't know what's going on. And that's a little tougher. They want to bluff. No, I got it. You got to learn to detect that and know who you're working with. Um, in that case, you probably need to go a little slower with a person like that and over explain a little, and wait for them to get grumpy and say, I've got it, move on. All right, Paul Cutsinger. Hey, party people. Good to see you, Paul. Um, <clears throat> so Pink Dragons added, I also have found that with execs, your presentation can quickly become obsolete. So it's important to really know your facts and data so that you're prepared to answer questions versus present. Um, and that's absolutely true. You need to be able to go off script. Um, executives love to feel they can ask you any question, and it makes sense you're the person who owns the area. And so they're looking for you to know what you're doing. And they feel like they should be able to ask you anything. And if you think about this, you work on a project maybe 50 hours a week. Maybe it's the only thing you do. Maybe it's a quarter of your job and you work on it 10 hours a week. And they work on it two hours a month or two hours a quarter. They figure you should know everything about it. And so in that room... You do need to be on top of your facts. Now, it's completely okay to say, I don't know. And it's way better to say, I don't know, than to guess or gamble that someone does know uh, that you can make it up or BS your way on the fly because that will lose you credibility forever. And that's probably a good story for me to share at this point. Um, <clears throat> A good story is years ago, I was sitting um, in Amazon's leadership team with Jeff Bezos and all of his direct reports uh, for our annual planning meeting. And um, he was going through our budget and we were asking for a lot of additional headcount to build a project. And he got to a line where we said we needed 25 people. I think basically all of them knew or up from like two. Uh, to do marketing. And it basically just said 25 people marketing. And he asked, what are these 25 people going to do? And the person answering the question wasn't crisp on the details of what those 25 people were going to do and why it needed to be 25 people rather than 15. And we lost credibility at that moment um, because they went back and forth once or twice and, uh, Jeff wasn't satisfied with the clarity of that answer. And he was very clear at that point though. He said, it doesn't seem like you have a good answer to this. 
And that leads me to distrust all your other budget numbers because I don't have time to ask you about every line of your budget. And the first time I ask you, and I think he asked us twice, I think he said the first two times I've asked you, you haven't known. And you haven't really been able to explain to me what you're going to get out of this. So that's an example where, well, I should share what he did. So he said, I want you to come back next week with your whole budget ask broken down into groups of no more than two or three people. And we'll go over it at that level of detail. Because it's hard to say what 25 people are going to do, but it's pretty easy to say what two people are going to do. So we had to go away and unroll our whole budget into this detail. And then he invested in that. But that cost us a lot of credibility and we had to earn that back the hard way over time. I will also say he took a red pen through a lot of the things that we thought we needed. And so our team really shrunk. Oh, good. I see people putting in questions too. Thank you very much for doing that. It's a big help. Um, and if anybody uh, in the audience, I know several of you just joined, if you want to vote on questions, you open up the widget that says, ask the easy coach a question. Uh, those of you who are in chat already are clearly logged in. And if you want to upvote a question, you click on the little up arrow next to the 50 point score, and you can add 50 points for free. I don't expect anybody to pay here. If you do ever spend on this channel, as the chat bot sometimes says, all of that goes to the Washington Trails Association after we cover our costs of equipment. Um, and so everything goes to charity. I'm not looking to make anything out of doing this stream. Um, that said, you voting helps me decide and know what questions to answer in what order. And so it's super helpful to me that you go ahead and vote to sort the questions. And then if you're on mobile and you're hearing this, we don't have voting on mobile yet. We're working on that. But if you do want to ask a question, you can put it in chat and one of the moderators will add it. So we have a question from Matt 3.0 I'll take now. Execs are often with each other all day having a debate and you're not privy uh, to that takes over your meeting. How do you manage that? Um, so let's see if I understand this. Are often with each other all day having a debate that you're not privy to that takes over your meeting. So basically their debate spills into your meeting. Um, that's super tough. Controlling a meeting, particularly with several people who are higher level in a company than you can be really tricky. Um, but most executives do respect time. And so I think what you can do there is you can interrupt and say, I'm not sure I'm following what you're talking about. Is it relevant to this meeting because we only have limited time? Now that's a little bit blunt. Maybe you come up with better wording in your head or you know some of the people and you know how to interrupt them. But basically it's your meeting. You do have to try to take control of it. Now, if the executives really want to finish their side debate, they will usually be clear about that. They will say something like, here's how it's relevant. Or they'll just tell you straight up, we have a crisis going on. We have to handle it right now. And so I know several of the viewers uh, tonight are from Amazon where I work. And this is a good time to insert, by the way, my standard disclaimer even though I reference stuff I've done at Amazon, my opinions here are my own and I'm only speaking for myself. I'm not speaking for Amazon or Twitch at any point on the Easy Coach. Um, <clears throat> and so if you have questions there, as it says in chat, please direct questions about Amazon or Twitch directly to the official channels. But it's a great time to share. Um, a funny story about Amazon. Within Amazon, there are these emails known as question mark emails. And what a question mark email is, is when a um, Amazon customer emails Jeff Bezos, which people can do, he's just Jeff at Amazon and this is well known, and they email him with a customer complaint, his team will look at that, and sometimes Jeff himself will look at it. He used to look at them all himself. I don't know if he does anymore. 
But he would then forward that question if he thought it was legitimate and not some sort of standard complaint that his team could handle or that he felt he could safely ignore because it was well known or something he didn't agree with. He would forward the complaint to the man, the, the person who reports to him or that he thought owned that area at the top level. And then what he would do is he would just stick in a question mark. And what that question mark means is, I don't know what's going on here, but it sounds like a problem. You better go look at it. Have someone look at it and tell me what's going on. And that email would cascade because thanks to first Blackberries in the old day and now smartphones, everyone's on email all the time. And so that email will go, say, from Jeff to the CEO of the group, um, whatever group that is, if they have a CEO or an SVP, to the VP, to the director, to the manager. And it's called a question mark email and it cascades really quickly. And at some point, someone ends up with this email and is like, uh-oh, this is my project. And a customer has complained to Jeff about it. So the funny part of this story, uh, because it's relevant to what happens when something goes off topic in a way, is I got a question mark email at about 5.45, about 10, 12 minutes before I was supposed to go live on this stream. And uh, so I'm scrambling on my phone real quick, which members of my team can I loop in? And how this comes back to the question I was asked, and see, my phone's in my pocket. I won't know if my team's on it until I get off stream later. But I trust them, and hopefully they're starting to investigate. Um, meanwhile, uh, how this is relevant is sometimes executives have something else on their mind. Answering the question, you can just say to them, do you need a few minutes to take care of that? That's a polite way of giving them space but also making clear to them that they are not paying attention to your meeting topic and they're off topic. Seems like you guys have something on your mind. Do you need a few minutes or should we reschedule following up on this topic? That's a very polite way to say you're taking up the time that we're supposed to be spending on this and I need you to come back or if it's really a crisis, let me get out of the room and come back when you can pay attention. I told you executives are blunt. They want to unblock you so you can do work. They will usually either table what they're doing or they'll tell you, yeah, actually we need to go do this other thing. The value of that is you get clarity either way and you're seen as a professional who can handle interruptions but who can also keep control of your own room. So that's actually my advice, having thought through how to handle that question or that problem of a side topic in the room is, do you need some time for that? Or should we reschedule and come back later? And executives hate to reschedule because they know that means delay. So they'll only do that if they have to. All right. Um, and I could tell a lot of fun stories about question mark emails. Uh, the best story I have there is there's two other things that used to come through in those emails. Um, the best one was a smiley face. That meant a customer sent in something and said, I love this product. It's great. Blah, blah, blah. They send through a question mark. Um, uh, they send through a smiley or, or Jeff sends a smiley and everyone in the team is happy and it comes down the line. Everyone's happy. The worst thing for him to send is words. Because words mean he has an opinion. He's not just looking for information like the question mark. Uh, but instead, um, he's got an opinion. And one time we had a customer write in. I won't go through all the details. But he had a complaint. And uh, Jeff's comment was, please tell me we're not doing this. Obviously, he didn't think what the customer was saying was very good. And when we gave him the answer... Uh, that we were doing it, his next reply was even funnier um, and it wasn't very good for us. We had a lot of work to do. So uh, that's kind of question mark emails. They're legend in Amazon. And um, if the room gets one of those, they're going to go off topic. You've got to be able to handle that smoothly. So um, 
Paul Kutzinger in chat says, the story you told about budget reviews was a good example of an exact spot checking. Um, depth surrounding of proposal was good in general. Are there other techniques they use to quickly gather the pulse that we should be prepared for? Um, great question. I'll take it now because it's relevant to what I was just sharing. Uh, how to exact spot check? Well, they spot check in a few ways. One of them is the quality of your presentation. If it looks half-assed, they're going to take it that way. And I, I use half-assed because it's the best word for it. You do want your presentation to be clean and your data to be right because executives have a fine-tuned sense of when there's smoke, there's fire. The other way they do it is if there's multiple people in the room, never have your own team disagree with you in the room. It doesn't mean silence or muzzle anyone, but if you're gonna go into a room with an executive, hash out your own disagreements beforehand, or so that you don't all look like clowns, be open up front and say, hey, boss man, boss woman, there's differing opinions on this, and during this meeting, you're gonna hear those differing opinions. We've structured them because we need you to make a decision. But if they see contradiction or people debating in the room and they haven't been prepped for it, their conclusion is, uh-oh, this team doesn't know what it's doing. They need leadership. They're not well led. Um, normal ways to spot check, though, is, are the, is the data right? Is it presented cleanly? So budgets, financial data, but pretty much any claim. Um, I once made a, what's called a naked assertion, a guess, without the data to back it up. Um, to Jeff Wilkie, who runs North American Retail for Amazon. And the naked assertion was um, something about our DVD business. And it was a guess. I was guessing. It was an intuition. But I asserted it like I knew. And he said, I don't think that's true. And he opened his binder to try and find the data to disprove me. I got very lucky because he couldn't find the data. Um, so he got me out of it, or, or circumstances got me out of it. But the point was, I asserted something that could be checked with data, and I didn't have it. Don't do that. I learned a lesson, and I got away with one. So that's kind of how I think executive spot check is. They're not hunting, by the way, for you to have flaws or failures. But if you stick something out there, and it's wrong, or you can't answer for it, it's more their antenna, their alarms go up really quickly. There are other ways they audit, but mostly they come in trusting until they see things that make them afraid. Then they start digging. So it's a little bit uh, like hide and seek, right? If you make noise, people are gonna look more closely. Okay, next question. Um, when applying for a job and your application is at the busy executive level and you haven't heard anything, um, should and how does one follow up? Great question. Uh, I think it's totally fine to follow up. Um, there are a number of ways to do it. Uh, you can try and follow up. So following up at some reasonable cadence is fine. Um, it's a question of what channel might work. Can you follow up through the person's assistant? Can you follow up through a peer, a colleague, someone you know at the company who can ask for you. All of those are better than flooding the person's inbox. That said, executives, as I've mentioned, get extremely busy and stuff goes unaddressed in my email all the time. Um, truth about my inbox. I am known as an email machine. Uh, people at work, there's probably some people in chat who can testify to this. I process hundreds of emails a day. I'm known as one of the fastest people at it at Amazon. My inbox right now has several thousand messages going back a year that I haven't gotten to despite that. And what happens is every month, my assistant goes and deletes everything from a year ago that month because I'm never gonna get back to it. And um, that's just, I'm never gonna get to those. So she goes and kills them and my, my inbox runs a couple thousand at all times. I hate that. I used to be Mr. Inbox Zero, if you know what that means, and I can never get back there in life. It's better than my personal email. My personal email sits at 18,000 unread. 
So I'm not doing as well there. But the point to answer the question is, it's completely fine to look at, to, to remind me of something as long as you don't nag. And I would say the usual interval here is three or four days. And a simple message that just says, hey, I was wondering if you'd seen this. Or, hey, don't know if you've seen this. I know you're busy. Can you just let me know you got it? Some prompt like that, and I will send a note back often to someone like that that says, hey, I got this, I'm busy. Or you can expect a reply in a week. Or I'm going to have somebody address it. I'm pretty sure all executives feel bad about not getting through their email at some level. So if you poke them politely, but with that tiny twinge of guilt, like, hey, just wondering if you got this, or could you let me know if you got it, they will generally respond, or they'll try and get somebody else to respond. Now, if you ask three times, or send something in and ask twice, and you don't get anything, it means no. It means I'm deleting it. It means I'm never going to get to you. It means what you're asking about isn't a priority to me. Like, I can just say, I don't know how you want to take that, but just deal with it. Um, And if it's internal, unless you have a different way to get somebody's attention or to reframe it, go look for a different job. For one thing, if I'm so busy, I can't respond to you three times as a candidate, I'm not going to respond to you as an employee either. Um, And so you don't want that job for that person. So that's just an honest answer. I love that people are voting. You've got a question up to 150 here. I'll take that next. Uh, How do you build positive working relationships with other executives that work in a totally different domain than you, e.g. marketing versus engineering? So you have no common ground, I think, is what people are getting at here. If you have no common ground, um, marketing versus engineering, uh, how are you going to build that relationship? Um, I definitely think relationship, I've recently come and I shared this in my last broadcast, I think, to the decision or to the realization that building relationship is a lot more important than I've given it credit in the past. As an engineer, I've always figured if it's right and it's on time and we're doing good work together, I don't need to know about your family. That's not really true. Um, People want to connect And they relate to those people that they feel connected to. And the secret here is that they feel that you care about them. So sometimes investing in talking about what someone did on the weekend is valuable work. It's also a really human nice thing to do. But spending that little time talking about how was your weekend or if you know anything about them, finding out or how did your sports team do? It was March Madness this past weekend. How did your team do? Anything like that is about showing human concern for the person. And so the way you build those positive working relationships is you build a positive human relationship. And then work can come naturally on top of that. You do then have to appear competent. And so first there's a human relationship. I can't do a full hour on how to build a human relationship But that's the basis, because if someone just feels you're using them to get things done at work, they won't invest in you, and they'll actually, no matter if you're saying good or true things, they'll still ignore you. Um, But uh, if they um, feel you investing, then you build the positive work relationship by asking questions about their needs and understanding what's important to them. Uh, Because if you're meeting their needs, and everybody has a set of needs, if you're meeting even some of their needs, or if you're even concerned about their needs, they will pay attention to you and to what you're doing. And you can build a work relationship about shared goals. So I think that's what you're trying to do when you're trying to build a work relationship with someone in a different domain. You're not trying to relate to them about marketing if you don't know anything about it. You're trying to understand their goals and how you can help. (sighs) Okay, just make sure you get the details right. I'm not from New Zealand. I don't think I said, yeah, I don't think I said that about uh, you, Jeremy. But if I did, um, 
Yeah, Kiwi reference, maybe. No. Um, all right. Great question there. Um, do I have anything to add about that? That's a tough one. Building relationships across lines. It takes time. Um, and it's about finding out what's important to them. Um, and then asking them for help. That's the other thing. Rather than telling them what you need, you ask, can you help me? Under what circumstances could you do this? You build that common thing. But it's really human relationship. Um, everybody who's worked with me knows I love to do lunch. Um, and the reason is humans are still human. They're tribal. It's very hard not to like someone or at least be more civil to someone with whom you've shared a meal. We're just deeply wired. And that's why the whole thing of let's get coffee, let's get drinks, that human act of spending time together over food and in that relaxed social setting lets you build that relationship. And that's why classic salespeople always have these huge entertainment bills because they're trying to get people away from the work pressure environment um, in order to be able to build that relationship in a more relaxed context. And then that relationship pays off because once you're bonded over a common topic or shared interest, you always have something you can go back to. So thank you for that question. Um, we've getting on in the show, so I'll answer a couple more. I appreciate what everyone has contributed. Uh, this has been a great talk that I've really enjoyed. Um, being able to share some of the stories, but uh, what advice can you give around coordinating agreement with a group of executives? And this one from Donkey Kong Jr. Um, this is a great, tough question. Uh, and I know Donkey Kong's circumstance, he's probably struggling with this or, or thinking about it. Um, in an executive team, how do you coordinate agreement? Um, there are two ways to do this. You can play postman if you're outside of a room and you're meeting with this executive, then this executive, then this executive, that can be very hard because you end up in the middle of their disagreements and I don't really recommend playing postman if you can avoid it. In a room, assuming you have everyone in a room and the executives are debating something, that's again a take charge of the room and start rephrasing or paraphrasing back. What I'm hearing is, try and get points of agreement on a whiteboard, points of open action items or points of disagreement. But you start looking for that common ground and trying to get clarity around the concerns or points of disagreement. And so when I'm trying to coordinate agreement, agreement through a group of executives, I'm trying to establish common ground we all agree X, we all agree Y, we all agree our goal is Z. What we don't agree is how many people we should put on it, how much budget we should spend, whatever those things are. And then you start asking, what are the concerns with budget? What are the concerns with headcount? What are the concerns with delivery date? Whatever the issues are, because you wanna get those out and maybe the executives will resolve them Otherwise, don't let debate spiral. Take it offline. Say, okay, it looks like we have disagreement about the budget. Let me get back to you on that offline. And then you can address executives one at a time. But you don't want two executives who are arguing about the budget to derail a meeting with 10 people. Um, let me take that offline is really good. The other thing I haven't mentioned yet, though I've implied it, executives love high ownership. And what that means is where you say, hey, I've got this. I will follow up on it by Tuesday or I'll get back to you with next steps next week. And then you do that. That's how you earn credibility. But taking clear ownership of the debated topics, it looks like we need a short follow-up meeting on just the Polaris project section of this work or whatever it is. We need a short follow-up meeting just on who we're going to assign to the project, who needs to be in that meeting, or I think that meeting is only me, Anne, and Jane. And in that way, you start downscoping it and you basically break off the disagreements 
and you try and leave with the room saying, so we're all agreed this project's important. It should have at least this much budget. I'm going to follow up with Anne and Jane. Then it sounds like you left the room with agreement, even if you have some topics left. So great question. Appreciate it, Donkey Kong. I hope that helps you. Uh, feel free to follow up later if not. But that kind of interaction is common and you're really just trying to document things. So we're down to the last question. I'll take this one. We'll call it a night. Um, so uh, Redmond asks, uh, recommendations for other shows like yours and for new, uh, for new and experienced team leads. So I don't know if Redmond's uh, watching right now, but I know he'll pick this up, if not, on our YouTube channel later or as a podcast. We do both of those shortly after the show is done. And the answer here is, right now, I'm not actually familiar with a lot of people doing similar shows in this live format on Twitch. But what I have seen is a lot of the audiences come and ask me, how do I start a show like this? So there's a couple of our usual participants who aren't here uh, tonight, Rory and Stedman. Um, they intend to start their own complimentary show, which will run before or after this one. And uh, they'll have a different take and probably uh, very different advice. They come from the nonprofit space and they work generally globally, internationally. They're in Ethiopia right now getting some things done there with the Ethiopian government. So their experience is totally different than mine. That's why I think it'll be a great complimentary show. Also, I have to thank uh, um, Plus David, who runs Studio Dave here, where I'm broadcasting. He's looking at starting his own show, which would also complement this. No doubt if he does, you'll see him up here with a different background. He likes the beach. Um, but uh, we, we're going to see more shows come up in this space, I think. So all of you are joining me as pioneers, bringing this kind of live interactive content to Twitch. I'm sure I'll keep learning about other people in this space. I'm looking forward to the near future where we're going to have our first live guests here. That'll be in a few weeks at the end of April when we talk about working in startups versus large companies and how to succeed in each one. Um, second, uh, we're looking at having our first author um, of a very good book. Uh, I won't reveal who yet. Uh, because he's not confirmed, but as soon as he's confirmed as a guest, we're going to have our first author here to talk about one of my favorite books. And so I think you'll see a quick expansion, because I can honestly say with you guys sharing out um, your interest and your experience, we count on you through word of mouth to talk about the value you get from the Easy Coach. Um, that's how we grow. And over the last week since the last show, we've seen tremendous demand. Uh, so I've seen a lot of growth there, and I really appreciate that. So with that, uh, we'll call it a night for tonight. What I will say is the next show should be very popular. Um, so if you do want to recommend it, that would be great. We're going to talk about the myth of work-life balance, because everybody wants it and nobody feels they had of it, have it. And so it's a myth. And yet some things you can actually do, particularly as a leader, to get some of it. And so we'll talk about both why it's a myth and how to have what you can from it. And we'll do that. Um, I'm going to TwitchCon in Europe. Uh, and so I'm going to be away for a couple weeks. But when I get back, we're going to do our next broadcast Saturday, April 20th at 6 p.m. Pacific. And uh, we'd really love to have you all come back at that point. Um, <clears throat> and thank you, Hale Mogambo, for the bits. Really appreciate that. And I, I love the old school bits icon. I have some idea who that might make you, but I won't call you out. So thanks very much for everybody who's cheering. Very much appreciate that. We've had a great talk tonight. Uh, hope to see you all back on Saturday the 20th. And between now and then, make sure you're connected to me on LinkedIn, that you follow our website, because I'm going to be posting more articles from the road to keep the discussion going. So with that, have a great evening.